obviously author of 10 books now, right? Do you have any in the pipeline also? Uh, yeah, I'm working on one called The Mystery of the Vanishing Lesbians, which is about <laughs> the erasure of recent lesbian culture as we start to lose some of our groups and festivals and bookstores. And some of that includes institutions that were started by Jewish lesbian feminists, and I'll address that tonight. Um, and I'm hoping to do a textbook on women's sports history. And if you count two other books that were going to press and the press went bankrupt, that would bring it up to a nice 14. But I'll take 10 and be real happy. Well, the ones that she did have so far includes um, Women's History for Beginners yeah, um, <laughs> and three Lambda Literary Award winners, Eden Built by Eves. Actually yeah. finalists, but it's okay. Okay. <laughs> this uh, is a finalist. And Revenge of the Women's Studies Professor. <laughs> <laughs> That's about teaching women's studies. It's a play. Right? Yes, it's also a one-woman show that I've done for over 20 years now about homophobia in higher education. And the book is essentially about what it's been like taking it from place to place, including many different countries. And? And this is Girl Reel. Uh, which is a collection of stories about lesbian images at the movies. Um, and this one includes uh, several stories about Jewish lesbian identity as a film goer. Uh, one story is about the year I lived in Israel and went to the movies every weekend. Um, but there's also a story about the film Yentl. And uh, that's a real resonant moment with a lot of all of us. And I'm going to end later this evening by reading part of that short story. I think you'll enjoy it, and it does end in a tattoo parlor in Chicago with Tony Armstrong. <laughs> As will all your stories, As eventually. will all my stories. <laughs> um, international traveler, founder of the Jewish Women's Tent at the Michigan Women's Music Festival. Easier said than done. It's a bit of an uphill battle of getting them to agree to that theatrical performer. Um, you work at the Women and Gender Studies programs in Ge at Georgetown University That's and right. George Washington University in DC. Mm -hmm. um, widely known to lesbian feminist audiences internationally at this point. <laughs> and um, your most recent title is the School <coughs> Girls Atlas. Yes. Which won first prize from Finishing Line Press. That's right. What is that book? That's a volume of poetry and it includes um, a number of poems about Jewish women's history including uh, the possibility of uh, women coming over as immigrants um, uh, in a ship such as we imagine in movies and many of us in our backgrounds. But what if some of those women were lesbians and were making love in steerage? That's an image we don't get from Hollywood. And um, uh, that poem was reprinted in a tribute to Adrienne Rich after she passed. Uh, they asked for poems that were written sort of in the spirit of what she had inspired and she very much inspired me to look at what we think of as normal ethnic history through a lesbian lens. So some of these I brought extra copies of and you can get one and I'll sign it for you. Others I ran out because I've just come from two different uh, conferences where I, you know, sign books and so forth. Um, this evening will end with everyone getting handouts and treats. I brought enough for everyone. So everyone's getting free stuff. And also, um, you have the opportunity in um, uh, the coming weeks to see more of me than you could stand because I've been selected by C-SPAN Author TV for a three-hour in-depth profile live wow. on hey, February 2nd. So it will air from noon to 3 live. You can call in and go, who is that woman? And we're going we're to put this information on the feedback from yeah. this event. So if you forget, you can look at So these things are over here. Bonnie also has some display things. And of course the program is free, but if you have a few extra bucks to help defray the cost of airfare for her to get here, that would be great. Um, okay, Bonnie. Thank you, Tony. And of course, my best friend and uh, the person who taught me everything I know. And you'll hear more about our alliance with Hotwire later, later in the evening. Um, okay, my goodness. Well, shalom, y'all. Let's start with that. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and it's an honor to return to the sacred living room. 
Um, what I'd like to do is explain a little bit about my unusual background, what drew me into looking at Jewish women's history, um, what I've seen in the past several decades of Jewish lesbian activism, identity, and awareness, and where we can see some progress and some steps back. Um, and I'd like to also address, uh, you know, some of the issues of uh, stereotyping, gender roles, pride, diversity, and gastronomic Judaism. Okay, and I'll attempt to do all that in a humorous, loving, and accessible way with plenty of time for conversation and, and an, a little reading since I am an author. So, um, I'm the daughter of a Jewish mother and a surfer, and that should tell you a great deal. What it means is my mother is typical of a first-generation American who is the daughter of an immigrant, was really ambivalent about where she fit in. Grew up with an abusive Yiddish-speaking granny in the back room. And I say that because it's important to break the stereotype of the loving Jewish granny who's always there with the cookies. That was not true in my mother's experience. She's made her peace with her more difficult granny. Um, but my mother's desire was to be as American as possible, as fast as she could, to assimilate as quickly as possible and to uh, get a Gentile husband um, and ideally um, make peace with uh, fitting into what was projected as the suburban dream for girls coming out of high school in the 50s. So she uh, married out, as they say, uh, and uh, met my dad on the beach in LA uh, on a happy August day in 1955. And uh, many people stood around the cradle wondering what the baby was going to look like. So from the time I was born, I was very much aware that I was the daughter of a contested intermarriage, that by Jewish law I was Jewish, and I had two sets of relatives each stirring the pot. One saying, identify over here, one saying, identify over there. And I was taken to each set of relatives for the different holidays, Christmas, Hanukkah, Easter, Passover. Um, but I was not giving very much religious instruction. My parents were peace activists. They did take me into social justice movements, so I was a peace marcher from a very early age. But I lived in West LA, which is hugely Jewish, so my home was very culturally Jewish with Yiddish humor, movie references, food, uh, film uh, knowledge. Uh, my parents were quick to tell me who was really Jewish in the movies and it changed their names. Um, and I was taken under the wing of my Jewish grandmother and taught Yiddish when I was 11. And I began to identify very much with that side of the family. And one reason that that happened is because I went to an international elementary school in L.A. where every kid was from a foreign country except me. And it was natural, in my view, that everyone had a language, a people, and a place they came from. And gradually I understood, for me, that could mean you know, Hebrew, Israel back in the day, and that I should pursue that information. So what I observed was that my father had been attracted enough to Jewish culture to fall in love with my mom. He had not run from it. I learned my dad had actually been the one goy in a Jewish gang at his all-Jewish high school, Fairfax High, very famous school that included um, a number of guys who became celebrities like Herb Alpert and Dustin Hoffman. My father had run with a gang of tough Jewish guys and had become a real um, sort of philosopher to them. And he knew as much Yiddish as my mother and was as invested in introducing us kids to the lessons of the Holocaust as my mother, even more comfortably so. So fast forward, uh, by the time I was in high school, I was aware that I had a real lack of religious education, um, instruction in, uh, you know, the heritage of Jewish culture in the 18th, 17th, 16th centuries. So I majored in Jewish studies in college, but oops, came out as a big homo at the same time. <laughs> so now what? And what was interesting was I suddenly discovered at 17 and 18, I belonged to two different tribes. And in neither area did I feel any kind of shame apology, disinterest, lack of identification. I was home with both tribes. I wanted to learn everything I could about both groups. And I plunged into 
Jewish lesbian feminism in 1980, bless you, which was a great year to become involved. Just at that time, Evelyn Thornton Beck was writing Nice Jewish Girls, a lesbian anthology. Uh, Joan Byron was producing photographs of uh, lesbian images. Um, there was never a greater time or a place, and D.C. is where a lot of these artists and authors live, um, and there was almost an explosion of interest in women's history, which was introduced in college courses overwhelmingly by uh, Jewish feminist writers. Women's history was underwritten as academic programs around the country by people like Gerda Lerner, Alice Kessler Harris, Rosalind Rosenberg. You know, the names go on. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg started out teaching women in law at Rutgers. So if you were interested as a feminist in doing women's history, you had a really good chance of reading a book written by a Jewish woman, often a Holocaust survivor. You had a really good chance of taking a women's studies class that was taught by a Jewish lesbian. But curiously, very few of these Jewish women teaching women's history were talking about what it meant to be a Jewish woman in history. You follow me? So there was a lot of feminism being produced by Jews, but there wasn't a lot of self scrutiny until a little bit later in the 80s. And so it was a very exciting moment to be involved in all this. One of the things that occurred to me was if I really wanted to be serious about learning Jewish history, I should go live in Israel for a year. So I got a scholarship to go to Tel Aviv University. And um, they had an American overseas program. You were thrown into a dorm uh, with whoever they matched you with. And whoopsie, they matched me with the only other lesbian girl in the program. <laughs> so what do you think happened? We just came out to each other and then moved the beds together and just climbed in for the rest of the year. So suddenly I was experiencing what it was like to be living as a lesbian in Israel in 1981. There were no support services, no support groups, almost nothing that was um, uh, a place for us to go and identify as couples. And it was very thought-provoking, because I went over there thinking almost I wanted to be a rabbi. And I came back very fiercely concerned about the status of women in the whole Middle East, and aware that I really wanted to do doctoral work on the status of women through history. So off I went to a PhD program in Binghamton, New York, which as I was describing at lunch, turned out to be the only place in the country you could do a doctorate in women's history. And it also had four synagogues and five lesbian bars. <laughs> By now, I was also going to women's music festivals every summer. And I was fascinated by this phenomenon. Wherever you went to study women's history, you would find Jewish women running those programs, students in those programs, organizing, activists. When you went to lesbian events, you found Jewish women organizing activists. And when you went to women's music festivals, you could go to a festival and everything from backstage to onstage to production could potentially be done by a Jewish lesbian. And I'm just going to read you a short list of what that might look like. Okay? So we start with the fact that the women's mo music movement begins in Chicago with the Women's Liberation Band, which had four Jewish lesbians in it. Then we move to Alex Dobkin and Maxine Feldman producing <laughs> albums, and Judy DeLugach and Jenny Burson starting the Olivia Collective. I'm going to be working on an Olivia Cruz later that summer. And this is from some of what I'm writing now. I just like this page. Through the 80s and 90s, it was possible to attend any women's music festival and randomly encounter an all-Jewish lineup on stage. You could have Alex Dobkin, Sue Fink, Frank, Maxine Feldman, Marla Beebe, Lynn Lavner, Laura Bergson, Ronnie Gilbert, Sonia of Disappear Fear, Debbie Fire, Jean Feinberg. You could have the comedians, Judith Sloan, Sarah Citron. Now, your stage lighting could be designed by Casey Cohen, could be assisted by Lauren Heller. Uh, the sound could be engineered by Karen Kane or provided by Pan Conrad and Lori Bennett. Or the stage could be managed by Brenna Fish. Or the MCs could be 
Amy and Elizabeth Ziff from Betty. Oh, and the whole festival could be produced by a Jewish lesbian, which could be Amy Horowitz, Havens Levitt, Robin Tyler, Lynn Daniels. Oh, and the distribution of the music at the festival could be handled by Laurie Fuchs from Lady Slipper. And oh, the 2002 film Radical Harmonies, you hear Laurie saying about how exhausted she was starting a distribution company. We just schlepped albums from state to state to state. If you were hungry to keep up with women's music, you could read the first feminist rock journal called Bitch, edited by the late Lori Torsky. And Torsky is a very prestigious name in Orthodox Judaism, if you're not aware of that. Uh, then we start to see lesbians coming out in Israel. And by the time we get to 1999, we have a festival called Lilith Fair, which the Reverend Jerry Falwell writes to every parent in America saying, don't let your goddess do that. Go there, it's named after a Jewish demon. Okay, um, we move on off stage, and it's worth noting that a whole lot of the workshops on goddess spirituality and Wicca are being led at festivals by Jewish lesbians. We have Ruth Barrett, Diane Stein, Starhawk. Then we have sign language interpretation, which turns out to be a very Jewish field. And pretty soon, it begins with Susan Freundlich and is joined by Lori Rothberg, Jody Steiner, Risa Shaw, Jennifer Jacobs, Joy Duskin, Kat Devar, Felice Shays, and Joan Watman. Interesting to note, the American with Disabilities Act was written by another Jewish dyke, the lawyer Kai Feldblum. And on and on and on. And I point out, none of these women are practicing Orthodox Jews. Every festival requires that you work on Friday night. <laughs> okay, so what's going on? Now the reason I present these lists is because one of the things I studied in college was the shrinking percentage of Jews in the American population. Uh, the American Jewish population had gone from something like 4% 100 years ago to less than 1% now. I am a product of that statistic, or I'm Exhibit A. Intermarriage, assimilation, <laughs> Uh, there are fewer Jews than ever before, but if you go to a lesbian feminist event, it's completely out of proportion. It's a huge number. So what attracts Jewish women to these causes? And this is what interested me. So what I found when I was in graduate school, I was in the epicenter of a moment when the feminist movement had brought lots of conversation about racism, classism, sexuality, and what, forgive me, we call in women's studies now, intersectionality, okay? You have to look at all these things. Um, and gradually, Jewish women were going, me too, me too, but notice with a question mark, because there was a lot of emphasis on unlearning racism and confronting racism, mm -hmm. And it was very awkward for Jewish women who had no place to talk about where anti-Semitism fit in there. Jewish women were kind of white, but not all white, and that part of the story was absent. It was made possible for everyone to keep thinking that all Jews came from northern Eastern Europe and not Iran and Morocco and Tunisia and Yemen and Mexico and Brazil. So Jewish women of color were rarely referenced um, and the discussion of Jewish stereotyping was put off because of the presumed more important discussion about racism. And Jewish feminists who said, but they're all interconnected, uh, were underconfident in a lot of conference spaces and other events in speaking up for a place at, at, at the table. Um, I came into all of this very aware of the delicate dramas that were unfolding uh, you had Jewish women leading workshops about unlearning racism but never referencing their own lives. In the same way you had Jewish women teaching non-Jewish women's history. Uh, and it seemed to me that it was very important to have a space to really talk about um, the unexamined stereotypes about Jewish women that were keeping a lot of uh, feminists underconfident. One thing that had happened to me my whole life was perpetually being told, you don't look Jewish, how can you be Jewish? With the implication that I was lucky that I looked the way I did, or that to look Jewish was negative. My experience in coming out as a lesbian, I thought Jewish women were hot. I wanted to sleep with everyone I met. I thought they were gorgeous. And I was amazed to find how many women had a story of not feeling beautiful 
that in American culture, Jewish women had been stereotyped as unattractive, loud, pushy, smart, but in an unappealing way. Uh, that those images uh, had been perpetuated as well by beautiful Jewish actresses lying about who they were. Let's examine a partial list there of who the hidden beauties are in our media-obsessed culture. So uh, we have um, Ethel Zimmerman, <laughs> Ethel Merman, okay, an archetype of woman who's loud. But then we have something like this, Beverly Sills. Now we're getting into the classy area of being loud, okay? <laughs> and she's, of course, not really Beverly Sills, she's Belle Silverman, okay? <laughs> Lauren Bacall, one born that way. Lauren Bacall is Betty Joan Persky, okay? <laughs> Uh, Sophie Tucker, of course, did a lot of Jewish humor, but not born that way. She's Sophie Kalish. Okay. Uh -huh. Natalie Wood, what a beauty. And she's Natasha Gurdon. <laughs> Lee Grant, Leova Geisman. <laughs> Jane Seymour, here's a good one. Joyce Penelope Frankenberger. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine May is Eleni Berlin. Joan Rivers is Joan Malinsky. Uh, Judy Holliday is Judith Tuvim. Um, there's a few more. Simone Signorette is Simone Henrietta Kaminker. <laughs> Paulette Goddard, a heartthrob of 40s war movies, is Marion Levy. And June Allison, the girl next door, Ella Geisman. Okay, thank you to Alex Dobkin for providing this list. <laughs> All right, so it was easy for someone like me who had been permitted to grow up feeling like. I looked like the all-American girl to see more ethnic-looking women as beautiful because we all are attracted to what's a little bit different. I could not identify with my mother's desire to make herself fit in more. Um, and my mother couldn't understand that having given birth to someone who could pass as a cheerleader, why did I want to come out as a dyke? Why did I want to tell people I was Jewish? Why did I want to invite trouble? So where I felt that I had been, as the book title goes, twice blessed, now I belong to two dynamic tribes that were both fighting for pride. Uh, my parents' concern was, I was identifying with two groups that would make it harder for me to get a job. And I feel sympathetic that their concern was not m moral judgment and oppression, but genuine, you know, you could go so far, why do you want to tell people? Because you can pass. So for about 10 years, I did a play called Passing that examined when you don't look Jewish and don't look gay, guess what happens? People tell anti-Semitic and homophobic smack right, right. to your face. Right. And I felt at a very young age that it made me a better witness. I had an obligation to be a witness hmm. to what people said to me. I was also very aware. I didn't really want to have children. Um, I was real happy having my students be my children but I was aware that the family tree ended here, and since I was the Jewish identified one in the family, I was going to have to perpetuate the culture in a different way, and it would be through speaking and writing and identifying. So you can picture, those of you seeing me at festivals, I don't wear much, but, but one of the things I began wearing in my 20s was enough jewelry so that strangers would see this, this is a Jewish lesbian. Don't tell the joke in front of me, okay? That's my mom you're talking about. That's me you're talking about. And nonetheless. Um, so one of the things I became involved with was trying to make positive images of Jewish women visible and sexy positive images of Jewish women. Not gratuitous ones, but images that were powerful, strong, and had some authority behind them. And creating spaces where that could happen was not easy. So despite the efforts of many activists to get Jewish, Jewish women's issues on the agenda at feminist conferences, often this ended in horrible debate about the state of Israel, uh, discussion that positioned Jewish women as victims. You know, everything is either about the Holocaust or Israel. And almost everything else, like Bella Abzug, good example, or women who had made strides uh, politically. The fact that the Barbie doll was invented by a Jewish woman, Ruth Handler. The fact that everywhere you look in American culture, you have Jewish women being inventive. Uh, that never got a lot of attention. Um, 
and it required so much uh, preparation on everyone's part to get all those stories and to spin them into a, a very beautiful web. So um, by the time that I was in um, <clears throat> the last years of my doctoral program, I kind of expressed to my doctoral committee, look, here's what interests me. I'm interested in women's communities, and I'm interested in the extremes. I'm interested in women in super traditional Jewish culture because I was not raised in it. So I'm interested in Hasidic women and how they identify with the American feminist movement. And I'm also interested in women-only space at the Michigan Festival. And I kind of went to my, my PhD defense saying, I know women who have swapped places in both of these polar extremes of women-only spaces in the U.S., women who have left Hasidism and gone to Michigan, and women who have dropped out of feminist life and have become sort of born-again Baal Teshuva uh, Hasidic wives. And the fact is, both groups see themselves as the alternative to mainstream American womanhood. Mm -hmm. And they would agree on a number of things, like, mm -hmm. you know, pornography or d sexual exploitation of women is not a good thing, that sort of thing. So, out of this, it was difficult to find a job. But almost <laughs> immediately, <laughs> um, I was actually hired at Harvard Divinity School for a year, and I taught the first ever graduate seminar on Hasidic women at Harvard. When I was 28. And in that class were ex Hasids, ex nuns, current nuns, current Hasids. It was an amazing space, and of course, mostly lesbians. And everyone was interested in this question of now that we've made the study of Jewish women a part of what feminists should know, in the same way you should know black women's history and you should know gay history. Um, where are we finding some ongoing problems with anti-Semitism? So here's what we found. In the year I was teaching at Harvard, there were at least three horrible conferences where Jewish feminists were treated badly. Um, at a moment when there had been a decade of Jewish feminist activism, coalitions between black and Jewish lesbians, and a whole lot of other progressive activity in every city in the U.S., mostly through women's bookstores and publishing. Uh, there were a couple of events that just failed in communication strategies. One was the Audre Lorde I Am Your Sister conference in Boston in the fall of 90, which people who survived it called the I Am Not Your Sister conference, <laughs> um, where uh, there was no space for Jewish women to talk about their identities, and at the very end of the conference when there was a speak out, one woman took the mic and said that all Jewish women were racists and everyone booed and hissed and the Jews who had helped organize the whole thing looked around and what what the hell? What what happened here? In that same year there was the famous National Lesbian Conference in Atlanta, <laughs> which had many problems. <laughs> but one of the things that happened there was Jewish women were given the chance to have a, a, a Friday night Shabbat ceremony. Mm -hmm. And it was put kind of on a stage in a lecture hall that was then going to turn into an evening program. So as the women on stage are wrapping up praying, other women are filing in, waiting for the talk that's going to begin at 8 p.m. And women who filed in started yelling at the women on stage, get off stage, we've had enough of this Jewish business, stop performing. Uh, and I was actually, as typifies my location, halfway between participating and watching. You know, we were I, there. Huh? We were there. You were there, remember this? <laughs> yeah, very so well. women are on stage praying, and I'm kind of in the front row taking notes in my journal, because I think what's happening is beautiful, but somebody needs to describe it. So around me are seated these women who are yelling, and, um, you know, somebody said, hey, hey, watch your anti-Semitism. And the women who were yelling said, we're not anti-Semitic, we're anti-Zionist. I thought, okay, the women on stage are worshipping Miriam's well. She's <laughs> mentioned the Israeli government, there's nothing going on with Zionism on the stage. It's become an easy means, or it had become by then, or it had been for a long time an easy means of silencing Jewish women doing Jewish performance, if you will, in, in a way that invited everyone to participate and now had been shame. 
So it was an extremely distressing evening, and many subsequent articles were written about that experience. Um, but it paved the way for a lot of women to feel there has to be a more private place for women to affirm, come together, and then go out and talk to other women. We can't perform being the Jews at conferences because people yell from the anonymity of an audience whatever their political schmear might be. By that time, I had gone to enough uh, commitment ceremonies in the woods at Michigan and little workshops at festivals to know that there were at any festival, easily six to eight hundred women who were Jewish lesbians who might like to have a place to meet. So I wrote a proposal to the Michigan Festival saying, we need a Jewish women's tent, I'll bring it, I'll set it up, I'll run it, won't cost you anything. Initially I got a response from Boo Price saying, well, if we do that we have to have an Arab women's tent. And I thought, really? I don't think so, because the problem was that uh, there was a women of color space, but white looking Jewish women couldn't go in it. Everybody else could go in and talk about their ethnicity. There was nowhere for us to go. The compromise that lasted one year was having Jewish women meet in the emotional healing tent. Uh, and I, I felt like that meant we were all in recovery from our Jewishness. We were in between bulimia and kleptomania. I thought, well, there you go. So, um, as most of you know, there, there was finally a, an agreement reached where we could have a Jewish women's table in the community center. And what really happened is I brought my play Passing to do as a workshop, and 600 women came to the workshop. And then we took over a table in the community center, and then from then on we had a space. So for a good 10 years, there were all kinds of very beautiful events, including the bat mitzvah of your daughter. And it became a way for women to talk about a number of things. Um, being the only Jew in a small town, uh, being the, uh, experiencing homophobia in the synagogue, or anti-Semitism in the feminist movement. But two of the most commonplace questions that people brought in, no matter how much I said, hi, I'm not a rabbi, not a therapist, people came in and wanted me to perform those roles. I'm like, I'm just a person who brings all these books and puts them up these little push pins and puts my brother's animal sheet over a table and then we have handouts. One of the things that was always uh, brought up was I'm finding out I'm Jewish because I was adopted and no one ever told me where I came from. Now what? Or, we're adopting a kid, but we're Jews. How do we raise the baby girl from China? So adoption issues were number one. Number two, women who came in and were just delighted to find that a lot of the performers on stage were starting to talk about Jewish identity and that if we had an artistic place that brought these artists, maybe we ought to be getting up and doing the horror in front of the stage so everyone else at the festival could see how many we were. So eventually the festival started having on Friday nights bands like Mikva, Metropolitan Klez Klezmer. <laughs> um, uh, there was another uh, couple of bands, uh, Charming Hostess is another one. Um, various um, uh, versions of different bands that did uh, klezmer music or Jewish women's vocals. Um, Ethel Rame, who had been Alex Dobkin's Yiddish song tutor, came and did a workshop. Um, Eve Sikular, who did um, uh, the uh, Metropolitan Klezmer, uh, did an intensive workshop on Yiddish theater women who did drag. And I have some of those images. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started having women get up and dance and also have um, brides raised in chairs to show how many Jewish commitment ceremonies were taking place on the land. This became more and more of a positive thing as performers brought their family members to do participation. For example, Alex Olson, the spoken word poet, her Yiddish speaking grandmother read a poem at one of the Friday night Shabbats. Um, uh, Various workers, mothers, came over to the Jewish women's tent saying, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, other people's moms um, uh, participated in events. Um, and some, uh, remembering Alex Olson's grandmother, also dove into the mosh pit. So there's a lot of cool. intersectional memories. Uh, we had an ASL Shabbat, done entirely in ASL. 
And we had a lot of older women come and say, I want a bat mitzvah, they wouldn't let me, I'm 65, can you arrange it? So I ran around and did a whole lot of this. And then a very curious thing began to happen, which was uh, attendance began to drop off at these workshops and fewer women started coming to the Jewish women's space. And this began to shift just at the time when there was a lot of renewed public shaming about Israel. Uh, Michigan did an opening ceremony that included an end the occupation demonstration, which was very good, but which singled out Israel as a country to shame. Something a lot of people felt uncomfortable about, because rarely had other specific nations, except South Africa, been singled out in performance for a specific kind of scolding. And with such a huge percentage of Jews attending, as opposed to white South Africans, um, my point was, if you had told me ahead of time, we could have had a discussion, we would have been ready. No one knew this was going to happen, and now 600 women marched over to me and <laughs> unburdened their feelings. And the summer after that, unburdened their feelings. And the summer after that. So it became fewer and fewer women with more and more embarrassment about Israel, all unloading on me, you can see where this is going. <laughs> uh, gradually, I was exhausted, and women were very content to just have maybe a Shabbat. They didn't want to be doing Jewish visible stuff all the time at fest. I felt sympathetic that, yes, I would like to be in a kissing workshop or one of the other erotic uh, intensives rather than resolving the Middle East peace crisis. <laughs> How come everybody else is going to the kissing workshop or the dildo Olympics or whatever you can do in Michigan and we're here feeling like we have to bring about world peace? That's part of the story, which is if you're in it for justice, you never stop working. Are you allowed to just chill out? No, we're not. But that burden created kind of a, uh, you know, a tension and Michigan is an unusual situation for various reasons. Financially, they had to downsize. So eventually they said, you know, you bring all this stuff and now there's maybe four people in there. Whereas we have all these teenagers, do you mind if we use the Jewish space for, as the teen tent and you can do workshops elsewhere? And I said, I understand. So this is kind of a, a, a race through what I've experienced as an activist, but it mirrors what I've seen going on in American culture, which is just with the same as with uh, the LGBT movement, there's an explosion of, self, of discovery and pride, a desire to learn about your own history, the sense that every person is an authority on their, on their journey, the desire to share that journey, to do it in a public place so that you yourself break down stereotypes, get the message out, challenge other people and interrupt their stereotyping, their ism, um, and then there's a kind of mainstreaming that goes on and a kind of fragmenting of the movement as people burn out or stop speaking to each other. Um, and then there can be a shift. And uh, one of the curious things that's happened, uh, something that, that Tony confided, she also has concerns about, the mood after September 11th. And what that did was make many American Jews uh, more conservative in terms of having long been peace activists now maybe putting their cards with we need better security, what about Israel, what about Iran having nuclear power. So now we see some very hostile journalists and writers who are Jewish women who are uh, very hawk-like in terms of American security and uh, defending Israel at all costs and so forth. The progressive left has become three times as anti-Semitic as it was before. And, and going to peace rallies in the era after 2001, one of the things I noticed were all the signs, Congress is Israeli-occupied space, and depictions of a Star of David with blood trickling down. That wasn't like the peace marches my parents took me on in 1966. And for the first time, I didn't feel safe at a peace rally. And that was sad. And I actually had to confront a little six-year-old girl who could have been me. And uh, somebody had shoved a sign in her hand, and her mommies had not taken it out of her hand. Uh, and it was um, a sign that said, 
uh, weapons are us, with little Jewish stars in all of the vowels dripping blood. And I said, you know, sweetie, that makes me feel like I'm not welcome here. Do you know what you're carrying? Do you know what this means? Do you think the Jews like wars and like weapons? Moms, uh, what's up? And mom was like, oh, someone handed it to her. And I said, well, you can hand it right into the trash can and I'll help you with that. So this was very thought provoking. Uh, that was the same day someone burned an Israeli flag in front of my apartment building. And all of this stuff, I understand where it comes from. But it's made it more difficult for Jewish feminists to continue the, the pride thing. Okay, now I want to dial it back and, and return to exactly how exhilarating things felt 30 years ago. Okay, and let's compare that with what's going on now. This is about going to see Yensel almost exactly 30 years ago. It would have been October 83. Okay. I went to see Yentl the instant it opened. It was my first semester of graduate school, fall 83. I went with a lover who was really unfamiliar with Jewish ritual. I caught her lighting her cigarillo on one of my blazing Shabbos candles <laughs> as we put on our coats to go see this very Jewish movie. The theater was packed with starry-eyed Jewish dykes, exchanging self-conscious glances of recognition eating homemade popcorn with tamari sauce and brewer's yeast. Remember when we were all doing that? Yeah. <laughs> Outside the theater, in a frosty glass frame, the movie poster for Yentl declared, In a time when the world of study belonged only to men, there lived a girl who dared to ask, Why? <laughs> Beneath Barbara Streisand's face was the tagline, Nothing's impossible. I explained to my girlfriend, Jews were commanded to study and learn, but Jewish women were exempt from this commandment because scholarship could interfere with homemaking. All around us, scores of Jewish feminists sent up a collective poignant sigh during the first scene in which Barbara cuts her hair and puts on a talus, the traditionally male prayer shawl. I told my girlfriend, when a culture that prizes literacy and scholarship above all other things, above land owning, above military service, above athleticism, when it makes male powers yardstick, scholarship, and then denies for 4,000 and some years all of that power to girls, well, you're not going to find too many women scholars on record. Mm -hmm. Then I indicated the crowd. Look who's here tonight. Want to know how many of these are grad students and law students and rabbinical students? Do you know how many? My generation of brainy Jewish girls is going to reverse the history of female exclusion from learning. Yeah, said a young, thank you. <laughs> yeah, said a young lesbian rabbi next to us, joining our conversation. And before us, it was the Jewish women who pushed the second wave of feminism across America. Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, Bella Abzug, Shulamith Firestone. And don't forget the writers, composers, artists, thinkers on screen. Barbara had put on male yeshiva boy drag in order to pursue a lifestyle of Talmudic study. God, she's hot, murmured a young medical school intern sitting next to me who came to the movie wearing a yarmulke and a double women's symbol in addition to her stethoscope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what the big deal is, said my non-Jewish girlfriend, settling back in her seat. There's a lot of boring songs in this movie. I kicked my hand on her knee, but in my mind it was Barbara's knee. <laughs> All over the theater, Jewish women were laughing, crying, eating, moaning, transmitting an almost audible radio frequency of what might be called cultural arousal. Arousal. Cultural arousal and desire. For this was the moment we had all waited for, through years of renting Barbara Streisand movies. Barbara, who during her 1972 concert at the Forum declared she would never have her nose changed. Here was the chutzpah girl chick herself in a story blending the highest of scholarly ambitions with lust and desire. Embodying my own personal credo that good brainy talk is indeed arousing and study partners do become passionately attached. <laughs> so there's more. But um, that was the mood. The mood was, thank you, Title IX, thank you to our mothers for making it possible for my generation of Jewish women to go to advanced degrees and then be able to do all this historical research or whatever. Um, but the reason that this is, this is important to me is because it's also a moment when there was a lot of gender bending and people were not only allowed to see the homoerotic subtext in that film, everyone was 
once again invited to see Barbara Streisand as cute, hot, attractive, whatever. I felt like it was an important moment where a lot of lesbians were able to say, well, I identified with Amy Irving. Well, I identified with Barbara. Well, I like Amy. Well, I like Barbara. And we all sat around in our kitchens just like so hot for these actresses. And what they symbolized was there were Jewish girls playing Jewish girls and acting out scenes where Jewish girls liked each other or thought they might. And that was something that was playing all over the country and everyone was watching it. That was Hollywood. And so I think we've moved away from that mood of possibility to where we now have a very traditional view that Jewish gay people are part of faith and family. We're pushing gay marriage and religious belief in the public sphere as though to reassure everyone we're all American after all. And the radicalism of the feminist lesbian 80s and 90s that I participated in has waned. Um, and the difficulty of bringing up the issue of Jewish pride is always answered with the question of Israel, etc. So my interest now is making sure this past that's so recent isn't erased. So what I'm trying to write about is the, the whole 15 years of running the Jewish tent in um, my larger manuscript, which is about the erasure of lesbian culture. Um, what, where's the archive of that whole era of the Jewish tent with thousands of women going through and experiencing being changed? It's in my living room. It's on a red shelf. The notebooks women wrote in, this is what this means to me. What about those performances on stage where 600 women got up and did the horror while a pregnant cantor from the band Devon sang? It's in my living room. I taped all that shit and I never asked anybody's permission. Put that on YouTube. I'm not going to use it wrongly. It's all part of, I need to know what really happened. My mother has made peace with my need to identify with two contested groups. And as she gets older, she has made peace with her history. She made peace with the tension with her own grandmother through a series of award-winning sculptures. I'm really proud of her. And she became an artist over the age of 60. And I can also say that as she gets older, she remembers more and more Yiddish and will use it in conversation and say, didn't I tell you this? I'm like, no. Don't you know what this means? Like, write it down really quickly. And one of my favorite expressions she taught me recently was Habdir on Buterein, <clears throat> which means I've got you naked in the bathtub now. You know, I, I know something oh, about you, I got you. Um, that kind of thing. Um, another is when you're sarcastically apologizing and you say uh, something, something from Padevsha. I'm sorry from the bottom of my shoes already. Okay? Uh, these kinds of expressions. The person who really was responsible for introducing Yiddish in uh, lesbian music festivals and concerts was Alex Dobkin. And uh, she and several other people always made a point of saying it was harder to come out as a Jew than as a lesbian. And that neither group was ever supposed to survive. And she always did as the third song in her show um, a Yiddish song uh, to keep the language alive. And in introducing uh, these very serious issues, she would also add a note of humor. Yiddish has always been a women's language because the scholarly men learned Hebrew. The Yiddish-speaking women developed in Yiddish slang more insults for men than you'll find in any language <laughs> on earth. You're a schnook, you're a schmink, you're a schlub, you're schmagegi, you're meshugana. You know, the, all of the insults for guys from frustrated women. A lot of Yiddish insults are also food-based. When you can't own land, what you're going to have is a root cellar with beets and carrots and potatoes and onions. That's the diet, and those are the curses. Onions should grow from your belly. Beets should sprout from your head. You should grow like an onion with your head in the ground. These are the insults that women develop. And we now have several generations apart from the great wave of people who came into the U.S. before and after World War I and World War II. There's a lot of interest in reviving Yiddish, Yiddish as a language. 
But where all of these things have come together in the gay community, um, there's affection for a place we all came from. There's not as much interest in perpetuating it. We look to the old country as um, that was Fiddler on the Roof, and now a lot of assimilated living. My argument in the work I'm doing next is you can say the same thing about festival culture. Women who continue to go to Michigan and defend it are like Orthodox lesbians. We still are going to the old country. Um, and just as Israel has become, here's a sacred piece of land that's now contested, and if you are affectionate for it, you're a bad person. I think those similarities are too similar to overlook, and I think that both of the places or regional interests I took as my area specialty, it's almost impossible for me to present my work anywhere in the country because both Jewish history and festival culture are now so controversial, my papers are rejected everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. I looked at sacred spaces that have boundaries around them in terms of what they meant to women, but politically they've become complicated hot potatoes. So, I wouldn't change anything I did. I'm still interested in these same issues, but I think you understand, in, in trying to write this next book, what I'm really looking at is, how do you begin to erase a cultural identity? What have we learned from the past that we don't want to do again? How do we archive and catalog the Jewish feminist movement? There's a lot of terrific articles. So what I want to leave you with are a couple of <coughs> thought-provoking freebies. Okay. One is a lovely Xerox from this dynamic volume, Hotwire. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a special issue because uh, not only did I have the honor of contributing just a little piece celebrating Jewish identity at festivals, and this is from, woo, January 93. It just happens to be an issue that has um, a review of the West Coast Festival by Tony Armstrong Sr. Oh. It has Georgette Harper's Lesbomania. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course, the cover is Z Budapest, Women's Spirituality, as interviewed by Tony Jr. and many other uh, Chicago people. And I'm seeing several authors who have passed from us. That would include Chris Kovic and one or two people who made unsuccessful passes at me. <laughs> okay, so um, anyhow, get warm in here, no? Uh, I Xerox the original article for everybody, so everybody gets one of these. And then something that I used to hand out at the Jewish tent. I can send it that way. This is, so what's a Jewish woman? Um, and I'll just read a few examples. She could be North American woman who appears Caucasian and benefits from white privilege, or a Jew of color working to preserve the traditions of Ethiopian, Yemenite, Iraqi heritage, or a woman raised in an Orthodox home who's separated from that background, or a woman who grew up speaking Yiddish and loves Yiddish theater, or a woman coming out as a lesbian in Israel, or, and on and on and on. Four pages, it's not all one thing. So everybody gets one of these. Okay, and I um, just wanted to show you the range of literature that's still being published is very thought-provoking. We do have Jewish lesbian erotica. Friday, the rabbi wore lace. <laughs> yes. We have lesbian-oriented ritual. This is Ruth Simpkins, like an orange on a Seder plate, a lesbian Haggadah. This if is a, anyone in class would like to do oh, a women's seder, we have six or seven copies, copies of, of this. Uh -huh. thing. Yeah. And then this is a new book, Keep Your Wives Away From Them, Orthodox Women, Unorthodox oh. Desires, yeah. mm -hmm. which is a very important new volume. This is the oldest book in my uh, shelf on Jewish feminism. It's from 1891, translated from the German. For our Berlin, Berlin guest, Nahida <laughs> Remy's Nahida Remy's The Jewish Woman, translated from the German, 1891, a book about the status of Jewish women, and it has this great line: "Jewish women prove of singular attractiveness to every unbiased observer. Their peculiar beauty was the theme of songs throughout the centuries." 
So let's remember the Song of Songs from the Bible. Oh, that you would kiss me with the kisses of your mouth, for your love is sweeter than wine. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And it goes on from there. So I'm going to pause there. Thank you very much. And we can talk.